And what we found out in all of these cases is the bank has a ventures arm and they would invest because they like what you do and they want to see it maybe in the bank. But the bank has a, you know, a brokerage arm which is competing with you. And it's very, very hard to overcome that cannibalization. Hey, Founder Fam, Nathan Chan here, Sion Publisher of Founder Magazine. Welcome back to another Founder Interview. If you are enjoying these interviews, we interview some of the greatest entrepreneurs of our generation. Please do make sure you subscribe. We're working super hard to find you the most craziest, successful founders that you might not have heard of, you might know the brand, and it's insane. Some of the insights, knowledge, experience, lessons learned they share with you. And shares with some friends, like we're trying to really help you start or grow a successful business however we can. Make sure you give us a thumbs up. The YouTube algorithm loves it. And then also leave a comment below. Would love to hear your thoughts on this interview, your biggest takeaways, any learnings. We write back to every single comment. So today's guest, his name's Yoni Asia, and he is the co-founder and CEO of a company called eToro. So this is the largest social media investment network in the world. They have like well over 10 million plus users and I'm gonna really pick Yoni's brain around all sorts of things, how he's built this incredibly large company. I'm sure you've been living under a rock if you haven't seen their ads of like Alec Baldwin. Uh, we talk, I'm gonna talk to him about like, you know, how did he get a dinner with Warren Buffett? Um, how the hell he scaled this massive company and so much more. So. Yeah, look, Yoni, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I'm ready, let's go. So uh, yeah, the first question I ask everyone that comes on is, uh, how did you get your job? Well, I, I've always been passionate about trading. I started trading when I was about 13, uh, and, I, I, and I'm a computer scientist by profession. Uh, so I always loved the intersection of technology and finance. Uh, and uh, in 2006, uh, my older brother, Ronen, did some work for Bloomberg, and he was doing a, an industrial design master's in the Royal College of Arts. And he always used to make fun of me that I have an accountant fetish, that when I look at, when he looks at what I do, it looks horrible with multiple screens and charts and excels. Uh, and we started brainstorming about how can we simplify the user experience. How can we hack the user experience to make trading and investing something that's accessible for more people? Uh, and and that's how we started Toro, really with the vision of opening the global markets for everyone to trade and invest in a simpler and transparent way. Yeah, wow, crazy. So, uh, fourteen year journey thus far. You guys are now the world's largest social investment network. Incredible growth. Like I'm sure anybody watching this has probably seen your guys' ads with like Alec Baldwin and like, you know, like massive, massive company. So um, just to give the audience a little bit of an idea of, of those who haven't and are not familiar with eToro, they've been living under a rock. Can you give us an idea of the scale of like users, team, like, uh, you know, sure. GMV, like, yeah. Sure. So uh, we're uh, about a thousand employees in eToro in 12 uh, global offices. Uh, eToro today is uh, the world's largest social investment network. We have 16 million registered users who can trade commission-free stock trading, cryptocurrencies, ETFs, commodities, etc. within a social network. So everybody can actually see follow and automatically copy top traders from all around the world. So you actually see people from all around the world, you see their performance, you see what they're investing in. And then if you see someone who generated significant returns over the past five years, you can simply take a thousand dollars and start copying him in the same place where you can buy shares of Google or buy Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible concept. So um, like many people thinking and watching like, how the hell did this start? Like, where do you start to create like a, an, a, an extremely fast growing fintech company where, you know, you guys like, you've never done this before. This is your first, is this your first startup? Uh, for me, this is actually my second startup. Uh, so before that, uh, I founded a company called CD Ride, uh, where we uh, developed and installed cameras on roller coasters. 
So you go, you would go to Six Flags and you would get off the roller coaster and then you'd see a video of your entire ride and you'd get it on a DVD. So that was my first startup, uh, which I, I joined uh, I, I, and, and founded just as I left my army service. But, but I, I think, you know, we were passionate about um, how to simplify access. Uh, we started sort of building the product itself. I remember when we went and raised money. And again, remember, this is too, I'm, I feel so old. 2007, uh, you know, it's a bit pre-cloud. It's almost pre-social networks. I had a server in my house connected to the internet and a client uh, a desktop app that connected to that server, which was running like fake quotes just to be able to show what we're trying to do. Um, and after uh, we uh, completed the, our, we did a first round of $1.7 million. Um, and nine months after we launched the platform to the world, um, it was uh, extremely sort of interesting because we had really no idea where users would come from. Uh, but uh, we brought in people uh, that were sort of experts in online uh, marketing. Uh, and then just users started coming from a hundred different countries. Yeah, wow, interesting. Um, so how did you guys get your first users? I don't know if it's the first. The first were, were probably friends and, or family, right? Uh, I, I still remember they, they have like these very sort of low CADs. It's the customer identification. Uh, but I think what we did is once we launched the platform and everything was operational, uh, we just started uh, spending money uh, to acquire customers. So we, we just uh, uh, started putting our ads out there and we started seeing cu customers sort of come in. And ever since uh, we're, we are uh, a very data driven and ROI sort of performance marketing oriented. Uh, so, you know, any place where we spent a dollar and saw three dollars come back, we just kept on spending and pushing. So we had a very a significant scale already. The first year of operation, we had five point five million dollar revenues, uh, and the second year of operation, we had seventeen million dollar revenues. So compared to yeah, so compared to some startups, we really scaled revenues relatively fast. Yeah. Wow. And. And from the sounds of it, that's not like obviously network effects was taking place because you've created um, this incredible kind of yeah, social investment network. But at the same time, to further fuel and add gasoline to the fire, you guys were using pay, paid advertising from with a performance marketing mindset and, and, and framework or, yeah, you know, I don't know if you call it a, a mindset. Is it a mindset or is it a framework? Yeah, performance driven marketing. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably both. Uh, it, it means you're very data oriented uh, in the way you think about marketing. Yeah. So um, what channels were they back then that you were using? Was it mainly AdWords? I think uh, back then it was pop-ups. You remember pop-ups? Before my time. Oh, man. Yeah. I started doing online stuff like 2013. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, so this was like 2007 was pop-up banners. Uh, I think that's completely disappeared. Um, a lot of affiliates, so we still run a very large affiliate network uh, where we uh, basically pay for a performance for referring customers to us. Um, and uh, we were buying media. This was RTB. Like the media was very different back then in 2007. Yeah, wow. I bet you it was much cheaper than it is now, right? And it was cheaper, but eventually, you know, the matrix sort of stayed uh, very similar across the years. So we spend 200, yeah, 200 to 300 dollars cost per acquisition, and uh, uh, lifetime value is uh, significantly higher. And across the year, we just scaled this. So we're, you know, uh, now at four times higher pace than last year. Uh, but it, but the, the matrix themselves are very similar. That's interesting. Look, one thing I do, I have noticed, um, because founder, our company, we're, we're very performance driven. We would spend nowhere near what you guys spend, but we spend a lot of money, like millions of dollars every year. Um, and 
The algorithms are getting smarter, no doubt about it. You know, in, in any of these platforms, you can really train those those algorithms, and they can go out and find lookalike audiences, customers. You can tell these platforms now what you want your CPAs to be. So. Yeah, that's interesting to hear. Obviously, back then, CPMs would be significantly lower, but it yeah. sounds like the, return, the, the, the algorithms have gotten so much smarter that, yeah, it's interesting to hear you saying that the returns are, are very similar. So it sounds like you guys are going for, is it like, yeah, above a, a 3x CAC to LTV? Yeah. Yep. Okay, interesting. Um, so... Yeah, um, I'm curious then, uh, so when you raised money, um, your seed round, that was mainly to build the platform, not so much on user acquisition. When we raised the initial $1.7 million, it was mostly for building the platform. Uh, but as soon as we started spending money on marketing, uh, we did our uh, like B round, which was two plus two, so about $4 million. Uh, and that helped us fuel marketing. Yep, got you. Um, awesome. And then, uh, yeah, what happened next? Uh, long journey. Um, so, um, first of all, this was 2008, right? So my RB round, why, why was it two plus two? Because uh, it was 2008 and the world was collapsing. Uh, and for somebody who sets, uh, you know, uh, a financial, this was before the term fintech existed, right? So we were like an internet company uh, that's also providing financial services. Um, and then you realized that the banks where the money of your clients are could all go bankrupt the next day. And that was like a huge, whoa, what do we do? Like, and we started taking the money and, and spreading it across multiple banks um, because this, it was really scary, right? You had Lehman Brothers going bankrupt, uh, but it was also very, very exciting times to be in the markets, somewhat similar to today, but this year we haven't really seen a drop, uh, but I, uh, we definitely see something very big happening today. So what we've seen, uh, other than that, we've uh, sort of focused on, we constantly try to focus on what succeeded uh, from the product perspective, from an engagement point of view. Um, so again, I would generally say this is probably today sort of uh, no sort of common knowledge, uh, but, you, but you should look at what your users are using your product for and really figure out what drives engagement of these users and double down on that and double down on that. And for us, this was the social features. So we originally launched uh, basically the trading platform uh, just, just with chat and profiles. So the idea of the social network, uh, the idea of copy trading came later on because what we saw is that people were asking one another, what are you trading? So, and, and the, the constant dialogue of users were, hey, you told me yesterday you bought this, uh, do you still own it? So we looked at the chat and then we said, okay, so if everybody's asking constantly people, what are, th what are they doing? Let's just show them what they're doing. Uh, and that's how we built the social network. And once we had the social network out there and people's uh, performance was public, uh, it was a, sort of a very obvious aha moment to say, hey, if you can see what other people are doing, why not automatically copy them? Uh, so th that was sort of the, the progression. And at that point, I think that led us to also raise uh, sort of bigger capital. So we raised, I think, back then $10 million from Spar Capital. Um, that was our C round. Uh, and that was really in the beginning of the social network of, of, of figuring out that we are a social investing network. Mm, interesting. So the first version of your product wasn't what we see today. You've kind of built upon it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because I... It's it's funny because I yeah I thought I would have figured that you guys would uh, would have started that way. That's what I thought. Um, but it makes sense even if you think about it because I... 
I actually started trading probably in, back in 2009, 2010. And as part of you know where I used to do my research was these trading forums where that's where a lot of yeah. conversation goes down. You want to see who's legit, who actually knows what they're talking about. And that transparency, it's really interesting to see the performance of, of others. And I think, you know, when I, when I was trading, I also went to a lot of forums. But one of the problem with these forums is people are hiding behind sort of a nickname and you don't know what they're doing. And that's the fun part of Vitoro. When you talk to somebody, you actually see his portfolio and his track record. So you can have somebody tell you he's good if he is bad. Uh, and you, you actually see what people own in their portfolios. Uh, and that created a lot of dialogue uh, in the platform and a lot of trust between people on the platform. Mm, yeah, no, and then obviously accelerated network effects. Probably, I assume you had some refer friend. Uh, yeah. Yep, 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 very smart. Okay, interesting. So what, 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 what happened next? What was the next kind of step change of growth that, that happened? The next uh, step was when we did our D round, um, and that was led by Ping An from uh, China. Uh, and then we decided to uh, basically expand eToro into Asia, uh, into Australia as well. Um, although we're just doubling down now on Australia, uh, which has been very successful this year. Um, uh, so that led us, so we did two things then. One is we had strategics come in. So uh, uh, three large financial institutions invested in Toro. Uh, and we were trying to explore how can we work together with financial institutions. Um, that eventually led us to a complete and utter failure of realizing you can't work with financial institutions. This was, again, this was 2015, 16. Uh, it still burns um but maybe now things are a bit different but what we we were we really wanted strategics to invest in eToro so we can work with a bank and what we found out in all of these cases is the bank has a ventures arm and they would invest because they like what you do and they want to see it maybe in the bank but the bank has a you know a brokerage arm which is competing with you and it's very, very hard to overcome that cannibalization. Um, and banks view, uh, and that is that is changing now, but historically banks view any type of software company as a vendor. So, so you know, you would like go to a bank and you'd say, I want to do this in this corporation. Traditionally, the bank would say, so give me a quote for your uh, software fees and give me your code. That's that's how banks work. Uh, they don't want to share revenues or share information with anyone. Uh, I think now that's changing, uh, but this was really a, a sort of, um, you know, swimming against the current, trying to work with uh, finan large financial institutions back then. Interesting. Why, why did you want to work with large financial institutions? Why not stay independent? So we constantly looked at the fact that, you know, we are spending more and more marketing dollars to constantly bring more and more users. And uh, one of the key challenges of building a, a fintech company is you need to gain a lot of trust because people trust you with their money, right? So when you open an account in eToro, you set up a brokerage account and you deposit, whether it's $200 or $20,000, you fund the account with eToro. Uh, and we realized that we needed somehow to bridge that trust gap. Uh, and we thought potentially if a large bank took our platform, that could be a great uh, way for both the bank to bring us users, right? So instead of the marketing dollars, we have a distribution channel. Uh, plus, uh, you as a user should be very comfortable sending us a lot of money if, if it's in the bank, right? Um, so, so, so that's how we thought about it. Um, and 
I think now we're actually setting, resetting this uh, uh, sort of thinking uh, as we're thinking about uh, new markets. Mm, interesting. And you said like, yeah, you obviously tried uh, three, four years ago to, to go down this path. Um, how did you work out that it wasn't possible back then? And how did you work out to say, you know what, we need to scrap this project? Because I think when you have a company that has traction and when you are winning, you, sometimes as a founder, you can feel invincible and you, you realize that perhaps anything is possible if I put my mind to it and you tend to persist sometimes longer than you should. So how did you, in this instance, gauge that this was a project worth abandoning or putting pause on? Um, so first of all, I have uh, a great management team. Uh, so and in a lot of cases, you know, I'm the classic entrepreneur. I want to do everything at the same time. Um, but, you know, then reality sort of uh, keeps track on you. Uh, so I, I think in all of these cases, eventually um, management or a specific uh, uh, vice president came and said, listen, the ROI on this project is simply not good enough. We'll, we're, we keep on spending more and more efforts, and I don't think uh, we're going to see uh, results from this project. Um, and I think uh, we, when we see the, you know, something that is being a bit futile, uh, then we learned how to sort of close it or shut it down. Mm. And what would you say to founders um, that are watching and listening that perhaps they are working on a project right now and they don't have a next level management team? How do you how do you train that, um, I guess, gut intuition or like, yeah, just to know when to say no or when to stop and move on to the next thing or you know what I mean? Because it is tough, right? Yeah. Uh, it's tough, but again, I, I think a part of this is being very data oriented. Um, so I am a freak of data. Uh, so every morning when I wake up, I have about like 40 reports, uh, commission report, uh, uh, daily reports per region, per channel, uh, acquisition reports. So like every day I have these, these huge amounts of data sort of flooding me. So, and, and I want to know, like for, I have the German region manager, I'm getting the same report as he does, which is uh, the acquisition report, the revenues report and the data report on Germ on Germany. But I'm, but he's getting it on Germany, I'm getting it on Germany, but also on all the regions in eToro. So that's like, I don't know, 40, 50 emails that open my day. Um, and then out of that, uh, once you start looking at data and you sort of get hooked to data, um, I would say uh, if something, if the data shows that something doesn't work, you eventually need to kill it. Yeah, got you. Um, that's really interesting. But, but that's also, also something that's very important. And I think it took us a couple of years to realize that it's very important to set your KPIs. Uh, and your KPIs are not revenues. Uh, revenues is a derivative of your KPIs. So, because your KPIs are the company's strategy, right? So, if I, I'm looking for the largest, let's say, uh, assets, right? Assets under management, Potentially, I would only bring one client with a billion dollars, right? Uh, instead of uh, a million clients uh, with a thousand dollars each. Um, and, and I think setting that up and being able to crystallize what the main KPIs uh, are you looking at right now, uh, I think that was very important for us. And I, I saw something that really amazed me a couple of times. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure why it still amazes me, is you take a company and you set a couple KPIs and then the year goes by and you change the KPIs of the company. Uh, you change KPIs to people. 
you you see the entire organization shift towards something different like it's you you almost it's almost like you don't need to do anything else but change kpis and suddenly you see the entire organization sort of shift to where you are so the best way to do it is corporate strategy documents so which says vision mission values this is who we want to become this is how we want to get there um and that describes the sort of the why the strategy uh and the how and then once you set to that clear kpis it really helps everybody sort of understand where they're going yeah i i love that um it's so critical and it does and, it, and it's it's for whatever reason quite common in companies i've found that oftentimes the leaders or the individuals or the team oftentimes don't know what success looks like. And uh, it's very, very important to show individuals in your company and your team what success looks like because people want to achieve, right? They, they, they really do. And if you give them the opportunity and you set the goalposts, like you said, with the KPIs and you have a strong, compelling vision and then you have strong values, which is the DNA of, of how you want your organism uh, as, as a company, as a living being to operate, then it can be very, very powerful and people will rally behind it. Definitely. And I, and I think it's also um, sort of people should educate themselves uh, so uh, HR and organizational development uh, is is a job, right? Uh, it's a profession. Um, and uh, I, I've always been uh, relatively close uh, to sort of making sure I understand, for example, I'm a fan of Adijas uh, who, who runs a life cycle of companies and like uh, every manager, uh, does the survey to see whether he's a producer, an entrepreneur, uh, integrator, or an administrator. Uh, and then sort of at every stage of the company, you need to have different people. Um, and, and even today, so I remember going to this course in 2010 of Adijas, uh, and now I'm 10 years later, and now I have 50 uh, managers in Itoro doing courses on the theory of a digest on organizational behavior blah 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 so so again it's it's co constantly learn and also uh remember that you need to teach what you learn so sometimes as a manager uh you 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 constantly see things and you change your mind and and you were here and now you're here but you get disconnected from uh the the field and you need to constantly tell them listen I looked, I realized something, I learned something, this is why I learned what I've learned, and then you teach them what you've learned, and then they align with you. Because otherwise they don't understand, you know, you're like, shift here, and you don't understand that they, they're confused. Why, why, do, why did we change anything? Mm, yeah, I agree, communication, especially as company scale is so critical and it becomes a really big problem if it's not a focus. And yeah, to be honest, like that is something that I struggle with personally as a founder. <laughs> I need to get better at that. Uh, but we're not talking about me, we're talking about you. Um, so I'm curious as well, you said that you get these reports every day on your desk and you're, you're obsessed with data. Is that because you are looking for patterns and trends to further capitalize and allocate resources to fuel growth? Um, it's to make sure everything works. So if I look at like uh, the registrations from yesterday, right? So let's see, I can probably open it up here. Um, so I'm guessing uh, we should have something like 30,000 new registrations yesterday. Um, and you have as a manager uh, i have this sort of pulse to what are the again the main kpis what are the main kpis uh, and what are the main ratios that are healthy for the company right so if for example i expect uh registrations to be thirty thousand, and suddenly they're not thirty they they're fifteen thousand. 
then I, I know I need to drill down and figure out why why is it 15,000? So what I'll do is I'll read it out to the countries and I'll look at the trend of the countries. And then I'll try to figure out if it's not countries, is it channels? Um, and uh, maybe, uh, and that's why everything that I look at is uh, yesterday, this week, this month, this quarter, this year, uh, today and uh, last eight week, uh, the same day, eight week average. So, so it's like a very clear way to look at things and just try to identify if something is wrong or you're on track. Yeah, got you. So it's the pulse. You're looking for a pulse, but trends as well. That's always interesting too as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, switching gears, I'd love to talk about uh, Warren Buffett dinner. Can you tell us the story? That was awesome. Sure. Um, so first of all, it's, uh, uh, it's a reminder to be uh, persistent. By the way, if anything I would tell entrepreneurs is uh, one word, persistent. Be persistent, like VC doesn't answer you, send them an email again, send them an email again. Uh, and I'm saying that because like, uh, I, I'm obviously a big fan of Warren Buffett, um, read his books. Uh, you know, I love capital markets. He sort of represents what capital markets are in all their glory, right? So this, is, this person is the person who made the most amount of money in capital markets. Um, and what's very different between him and others, he always says it's like, it's simple, right? If you, uh, you, anything he does, he says, no, no, it's simple. Investing is simple. Just invest in companies you understand, invest in companies who have a moat, uh, and invest, you click for 20 years, right? So there's, you know, stuff like renaissance and hedge funds and algo traders but that he's a very he he says everybody can and should invest their money in capital markets which is really what itoro represents as well uh so uh when i saw justin sun so i, I was aware that it, uh, every year there's uh basically an auction uh for the uh it's i think it's usually supposed to be lunch in our case it was dinner uh, uh, for lunch with Buffett and Justin, uh, who is the founder of Tron, Justin Sun, uh, I think paid $4.6 million for it. And like the minute I read it, I started sending him email, telegram, WhatsApp, like bombarding him. And, and after a while, like he was, uh, let me think about it. Uh, um, and then he kind of disappeared and the dinner was postponed. And then suddenly, uh, their their guys call me and they're like, uh, "Can you come to uh, Omaha?" I'm like, "Yay!" So I was quite persistent with it. Uh, and the dinner itself was for me mind blowing, um, really a, a, a life changing event. And the reason is, as I grew Etoro, people constantly told me. I can't tell people that investing is easy or that investing is simple. And, uh, you know, uh, on the day to day of our life where you regulated and you constantly need to give disclaimers uh, and you constantly need to warn people from the risks of what they're doing. Um, but but really the purpose of why we started eToro was to start to, to make investments something that's simple and easy. Um, but, but along the years, something sort of made that, you know, ve- disc- put a lot of disclaimers around it, right? And I was sitting at the dinner and I listened to what Warren Buffett says. And uh, none of it, by the way, was surprising. He was right. He was right to the word to the book. I could complete his sentences because I read his books. Uh, so it's like, and suddenly it, like it hit me, I know what he's going to say. And I know what he's going to say because he's super persistent in what he's always been saying. Uh, and it's very similar things. Um, and the reason he's so persistent as a person 
is because if you ask Warren Buffett, what would you be if you weren't the biggest investor in the world? He said the teacher. And that was uh, and that's what a teacher does, right? The teacher chooses sort of what to teach and sticks with that and just does that and, and uh, constantly, right? And he says uh, there's uh, Benjamin Graham book, read it, uh, the intelligent investor, read it, follow it, and you'll make money. Simple, right? And, and what's amazing is how, how it's th that it's not common today uh, this is 70 years after I think uh, the intelligent investor came out to the market. I think for a lot of people, they still that it's not common knowledge that investing in the markets is easy and that you can generate double digit returns across many, many years um, just by investing in companies you believe in and understand. And, and, and that was for me like... Uh, in a how moment, just like wow, because it connects to what we're building in Etoro. So the minute I came back, I started the training uh, session for our popular investors, the ones who are being copied in value investing, and we created features for value investing. But but what it really sort of blew my mind is, it's exactly what we're doing in Etoro and what we're saying in Etoro. But the real real benefit is, think ten years from today, uh, I'll. In eToro, you'll see hundreds of thousands of portfolios with 15 years track record. Who has these track records, right? It takes like, it's hard to build track records. Uh, but on eToro, that's the basic track records are being built. And people are actually generating double digit returns across seven years, across eight years, across nine years. So that dinner, like, um, it was it really solidified some of your thoughts that had that you had, but um, you kind of, I guess, were, were being held back um, because of, yeah, the disclaimers and, and all these other things. And now, yeah, that, that's crazy that like, it wasn't anything new or profound. You think like, oh, you catch up with someone like, you know, Warren Buffett, and people ask me this all the time, like, oh, you interviewed Richard Branson, what was like the profound thing, like all these different things, but it's not really that, it's it's really, um, yeah, people, it, like it's stuff that you would read about, it's stuff that you would know about, but that experience really solidifies your thinking, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, um, yeah, I, I felt like there was a hammer hitting my head suddenly, and all of his books suddenly mean something more significant. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's really cool. So the experience to the realization, that's amazing. So look, um, this is an incredible conversation, Yoni, having a lot of fun um, chatting with you. Uh, now, uh, we have to work towards wrapping up. Uh, so a couple last questions. Uh, one I have to ask about um, the famous Alec, Alec Baldwin ads. Uh, they must convert like crazy, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so that was, uh, for, I'm a big fan of Alec Baldwin. It was amazing by the way to meet him, uh, and to, uh, sort of see him in action. So super talented guy, uh, with a very wide range, right? He is a salesperson. He's a comedian. He's a serious person. He's Trump. Uh, so, uh, and what I thought is funny is my kids are exactly the same age as his kids. Uh, so I, I thought it's funny because like our, we, we're targeting millennials, right? This year is the year of the rise of the millennial investor all around the world. Um, and millennials, uh, you know, uh, are, are reaching their prime. They're having kids, right? But when you have kids and a job, suddenly you have so much things to do. You don't have time for you to think, how do I invest my money? Um, and, and, and that's why we, you know, we built copy trading uh, and the popular investor program. So you won't need to trade on your own all the time and have all the ideas of what to trade and what to buy on your own. You can simply copy other people. Um, and what I found funny is like him being basically a young father, just like me, although he could be the age, you know, he's, uh, I think 25 years probably older than us. Yeah, no, that's cool. And 
I'm curious, like, when you worked with him, did you give a few different ad angles or there was just the one ad angle and the one script or like, and how long did you have with him? How did that work? One day. One day, a whole one day. day. One day, one day, it's a whole day, yeah. One day, a whole day, fascinating, fun day. Um, uh, but be, and before that, a lot, a lot of work on the scripts um and obviously a couple of days of setting up the the sort of uh, the shooting uh, place um so uh, a lot of details go into the scripts because it's it's not only the scripts like i i used to join the creative sessions at the beginning and sort of laid the tone but then it got broken down to a lot of like to multiple scenes and to more, like each scene you need to have from a different angle. So you're like, now move this, move that very like, it becomes a, an operation. Yep. Because you want to get as much leverage for that content as possible. For that one day. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. So how many, how many angles or many scripts did you have just out of curiosity? Hundreds, hundreds. Really? Wow. Hundreds. Yeah. Wow. And, um, he was shooting out of that whole day, how long, like six, seven hours? It, yeah, at least I, I would even say more. Yeah, okay, wow. All right, so you, yeah, you really, so you've got heaps of different angles, heaps of different scripts, ones that you can mesh together, yeah. you'll try different hooks at the start, like all different things, and you guys just exactly. test them all. Exactly, Yeah, wow, fascinating. Okay, very interesting. Um, awesome, well look, we work towards wrapping up, Yoni, because I'm mindful of your time. Um, uh, Two last questions. One, um, any final words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our audience of early stage startup founders? And then two, uh, where's the best place people can go to find out more about yourself and also eToro? Sure, so again, as I said before, persistence. Uh, find something you believe in uh, and be persistent uh, in getting what you want. Um, be open with others, so tell, don't, don't try to be secretive. Uh, tell people about what you want to do because that's the only way ideas can actually grow is through dialogue and brainstorm with more people. Um, and what was the last question? Yeah, where, where can people find out more about eToro and yourself? It, uh, it's very simple, eToro.com or download our mobile app and then once you have the mobile app, you can actually write Yoni Asia uh, and you'll see my profile on eToro. You will see my track record, which is not bad. I did this year 60% returns. Uh, and last year, I think I did another very nice, like 55% returns. So you can see my profile. You can see what I'm investing in. And you can ask me questions directly on my social network and my product. Love it. Well, look, thanks so much for your time, Yoni. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on all of your success. And yeah, thank you for what you do. You're building an incredible product. And uh, yeah, you're an absolute pleasure to speak with. Thank you very, very much, Nathan. It's been a pleasure. I hope uh, it helps some uh, entrepreneurs in their uh, way. Hey guys, hope you're loving our videos and that you're getting heaps of value from them. If you are, make sure to hit the like button and make sure to subscribe to join the Founder Fam. If you did enjoy this video and want to continue to master your skills, make sure you click here to access your free training now, where we'll go into way more depth with this founder.